The first three episodes were about the way artists in the Western tradition got away with making sexy pictures in a repressive environment. The next two episodes will focus more closely on the sexual parts of the body and their representation in art. This can tell us a lot about the way people viewed and experienced the body, and also about the way different cultures defined masculinity and femininity. The most interesting body parts in art are penises and breasts. We'll also talk briefly about vaginas, but their representation has not varied as much, at least in the Western tradition, so they don't require as much discussion. The interesting thing about penises and breasts in art is how much their representation differs from reality, and how much it is varied from period to period, culture to culture. Today's episode will be about penises, and we will go to the root of the problem, which lies in ancient Greek art. I am, of course, not the first to point out that penises in ancient Greek art are different from penises in real life. In fact, some of the questions a museum guide gets most frequently are about ancient Greek penises. Why are they so small? Or, if I can rephrase that, why are they generally smaller than average real-life penises? And did Christians, or did popes, or whatever, really break them off the statues? And there is a third question that people are mostly too polite to ask, but when you show them a sex scene, you can see that they want to know why, at least in some cases, the men don't have erections. To start with, when people talk about Greek art, they are often talking about sculpture. And I want to start by pointing out that the penises in sculpture are not remarkably small. Judged against penises from more naturalistic periods, they are generally a little smaller. What is remarkable about them, or what people are noticing, is that they are not only a little small, but consistently a little small. That is, they do not vary in size like penises in real life. In any case, their consistently somewhat small size causes people to wonder why they are that way. Could this possibly reflect some kind of physical reality? Uh, is it an aesthetic choice? Or does it represent some kind of ideal? First, let's deal with the question of reality. The lack of variation itself shows that this artistic fact does not represent a real-world fact. As does the fact that the bodies of males in Greek sculpture are idealized in a number of ways. In fact, you could say that the statues of males in Greek art have the muscle definition that only an adult can attain, but the penis, perhaps, of a pubescent. Clearly, penis size, like the muscle definition, is part of an ideal. But what does it mean? The place to look for an answer to this question is a different artistic genre, one which gets less attention from the general public, the painted pots called vases, i.e. mainly wine vessels, that fill galleries in most art museums. Here, when we look at the kind of heroic males who appear in sculpture, their penises are often really petite. In fact, they seem to adhere to a specific set of aesthetic criteria. They are small and uncircumcised, and they generally have a long, straight foreskin that extends well beyond the penis. I'm giving you a couple of examples. Note that these are paradigmatically hypermasculine males. One is Heracles, Hercules, I give you both the Greek and Latin versions of mythological names, who, among other things, supposedly had sex with all of King Thespius's 50 daughters, one a night for 50 nights. And the other is Zeus slash Jupiter, whose sexual ex exploits literally fill Greek mythology. So this petite penis was clearly associated with masculinity. Let me add in a couple of other surrounding issues. As I said above, there are many sex scenes in which the man is not shown with an erection. First of all, this confirms yet again that the representation of male genitalia is not naturalistic. And secondly, it suggests again that the Greeks wanted penises to be a certain way, small, uncircumcised, and non-erect. This does not mean that the Greeks disliked penises, far from it. It is, after all, the Greeks who started the long Western tradition of representing naked men. In fact, early Greek sculpture was largely adapted from Egyptian sculpture, but one of the big changes they made was taking the kilts off the men. 
They did not, however, appreciate what today we call BDE. And this attitude seems to have extended out of the arts into real life as well. Here, for instance, is a scene in which a young athlete is doing something, something to his penis. Something that Greek athletes really did, though we don't know how consistently. They tied up their penises with something called a kunodesme, which means a dog's leech. Exactly how the kunodesme worked is unclear to us, and why they used it is also mysterious. It clearly wasn't done for protection or comfort, as they did not tie up their testicles. But in any case, it confirms their preference for minimizing penises. All this is pretty surprising to a modern viewer, given our own culture's preference for large penises. But the meaning comes clear if you look at more vases, specifically at the contrasting large penises that also occur in vase painting. These are on satyrs, half goat, half man, mythological creatures that are perpetually drunk and sexually aroused. The Greeks didn't have concepts like sin or hell, but they clearly had a concept of shameful, and satyrs embody the shameful and ridiculous. In sexual terms, they do things that human males, or divine males, don't, at least in art. They masturbate, they give blowjobs, they have anal sex. And satyrs' genitals are a perfect contrast to human ones in art. They are big, like this example's penis, which comes up to the bottom of his ribcage. This satyr is the ultimate example. He's so drunk that he's lying on the ground as a donkey steps over or on him. His name is written next to him, Ukaleon, which more or less means not beautiful, and he has a large erection pointing toward the donkey's huge one, as if in sympathy. In short, to the Greeks, a large penis symbolized uncivilized bestiality, while a small, non-erect penis was part of the masculine ideal, presumably symbolizing his control over bestial physical urges, or more generally, the masculine, according to the Greeks, virtue of self-control. So it's largely an ethical symbol, but you can't deny that they had an aesthetic, too. Uh, for instance, they considered circumcision ridiculous. Like Ukaleon, the satyrs, or satyr apes, who are masturbating on the handle of this little oil flask, also have names written next to them, and the right-hand one is called circumcised. Also, in this scene in which Heracles, Hercules, kills the pharaoh Busiris, the Egyptians he is conquering have largish circumcised penises, while Heracles, Hercules, has the paradigmatic small uncircumcised one. The other main question that arises about Greek art penises concerns the ones that are missing on so many statues. Most people have heard that the penises in the Vatican Museum's vast collection of classical statuary were broken off. There is even a picturesque version of the story in which the broken off penises are stored in a secret drawer in the Vatican. All of this is almost certainly urban legend. Various popes, from Paul V in the 16th century to Pius IX in the 19th, ordered the genitalia of male statues, that still had them anyway, in the Vatican, and the nudes in the Sistine Chapel's frescoes as well, covered with fig leaves. But it is unlikely that popes in relatively modern times ordered classical statuary to be damaged. And why, after all, the penises, but not the scrotums? It is, however, true that Christians in earlier times destroyed classical statuary, and art that had to do with sex made early Christians particularly angry. It is also true, on the other hand, that most classical statuary was buried for a long time before it was recovered in the Renaissance or later, and that the more vulnerable parts of statues are often missing, not only penises, but lower arms, noses, etc. On the whole, it is best to assume that missing penises just broke off on their own. However, if a statue was possibly damaged with a chisel, then it might have been damaged by early Christians. There is a bust in the Metropolitan Museum that I believe is an example. The minor god Antinous, that is, the boy toy of the Emperor Hadrian, who was declared a god when he died, was, for obvious reasons, a particular target of Christian ire. 
and this bust of Antinous seems to me to have had its nose chiseled off. So the Greeks preferred small penises in art, and possibly in life too, for symbolic reasons. But this had a huge influence on the whole Western tradition. A great example is this statue by Rodin called the Age of Bronze. This is Rodin's first well-known statue, and critics who didn't believe he was capable of making it claimed that it was actually a cast made from a nude male body rather than a work of art. But Rodin, in order to prove that this wasn't true, had a photo made of the model, Auguste Ney, posing for the statue. And he's actually quite different. His head is larger and uh, possibly a little misshapen, and uh, his male member is larger. So Rodin has clearly diminished his penis in order to make him fit into the Greek-influenced Western tradition. Thus, most penises in any art museum are invariably small. Breasts, on the other hand, vary in size and location. But as we will hear in the next episode, they do not vary because of natural variation, but because of... Listen and find out. Here are the artworks which were part of today's episode. <laughs>